Well, all right, we're live. Kevin, all so right. you want to we'll go ahead and open it? Okay, yep, we're, uh, we're live and ready to go. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us for the, uh, the Jan what is it, January 3rd, I'm sorry, February 3rd um, meeting um, of the Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, thank you for all, for all of you taking your time to be here. We appreciate all of your work and uh, appreciate your time and, and want to thank you for being here on this cold morning uh, when um, evidently Punks Tiny Phil has said we're going to have six more weeks of winter. Uh, hopefully not, and we'll see what we'll see what happens. But I do want to call us to order for this for this meeting. And um, Paul sent out minutes from our last meeting, I think uh, Monday late afternoon, early evening. Um, can I have someone make a motion to approve those minutes, please? <clears throat> Motion to approve. Thank you. We have a motion to approve. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so the minutes were uh, approved and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So the minutes have been approved. Thank you. And uh, so we'll move on to our community health and wellness updates and. Um, we're now in the month of February, which is a red month. As most of us know, we see red and we see lots of hearts and uh, we see beautiful ladies in red dresses on Sundays as well. So I'm gonna call on uh, Garcia Williams Community Resource Center. Uh, tell us a little bit about Red Dress Sunday. Good morning and thank you so much for this opportunity to greet you on this chilly morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to share with you information about on two fronts. Uh, the Medi Community Resource Center, and that is a 501c3 nonprofit that I serve for as, exec as executive director. Uh, the Medi is focused on community health and awareness to assist in eradicating what we've come to know as social determinants of health. Uh, we use a number of different resources in order to introduce uh, health and wellness um, opportunities to our community, one of which is Red Dress Sunday. And I'll share some details with you about our events that are coming up for the month of February. But I do want to take a few minutes to share with you the focus of the Medi Community Resource Center. Our website, www.themedi.org, will show you a technology platform that exists upon entry to our website. Any user dialing into our website can type in their zip code and by typing in their zip code, they will learn of a variety of resources that are available to them at no cost or a reduced cost. So our focus has been to spread this information to the community so that they will understand if there's housing, utility support, foods, goods and services that they can dial in to see what is prevalent within their area and their zip code area. But what's more important about this process is that it provides an electronic referral system. Many social service organizations in our vicinity have those resources, but it is of a, based upon a manual referral process. So we like to say that the Medi is that technology that provides the glue to connect the users to the resources that can best serve them. So our platform serves to uh, provide referral resources, but we also serve as an educational uh, resource as well. So I would like to extend an opportunity to the Wellness and Advisory Council. During the month, we will be sharing some information and I'll go through the list of that, uh, what those resources are. But I want to invite you to at least take a look to understand clearly what it is that we bring to the table and how we may assist the citizens of this great city of Charleston. So during the month of February, two years ago, we joined forces with a concept called Red Dress Sundays. And in 2005, it was very prevalent in the Mid-Atlantic area. Uh, I am from the Mid-Atlantic area. And when I thought of this idea and how we could implement it in Charleston, we came up with a Charleston modified version. In the original context of it, there was one Sunday during the month of February where everyone celebrated, donned in red, ladies in red, men with red accents. But the idea is that we brought awareness to women's health and the heart disease factor. Many people don't know that heart disease is the number one killer of women. So we wanted to draw attention to educate and provide the resources to do that. So in its original form, Red Dress Sunday was that to share information through various houses of worship, 
drawing attention, what they can do, preventive measures. Some even created health fair events that each member could participate in to learn more. But the Charleston flavor of this said, we don't want to dictate that it had to be one Sunday. We invited houses of worship to decide which Sunday they wanted to celebrate. And we would provide speakers, educational resources, and tools that they could disseminate to their congregants or their members. This spawned a, a great awareness. And we were fortunate that we were able to have, as an honorary chair of this event, Mrs. Tecklenburg. And as a result, we had the benefit of being able to share information throughout the city. And uh, we then determined that one event would be a centralized event. And that's where Reverend Sears comes in because she was our focus of uh, the um, worship service at Greater St. Luke. They hosted us and she shared with us a very important and timely message relative to women's health. Many of you that know Reverend Sears know that she's the technology guru. So we've benefited tremendously from her resources, not only from technology, but her focus on health and wellness as well. So one would well imagine that when we look at 2021, we're not gonna be able to gather as we've in the past, but we had to come up with a virtual celebration platform. So today I just wanna share briefly with you what that technology platform, well, what our modified virtual version of Red Dress will be. We're gonna be conducting a virtual cooking demonstration. Many of you are aware of Chef Kimberly Brock Brown. Chef Kim will educate listeners on healthy cooking techniques and the latest trends that they can use in order to be able to prepare meals for themselves and for their families. We will be conducting that via um, a technology platform. It will be taped and rebroadcast throughout YouTube as well as our social media platforms. The second is our virtual, virtual worship broadcast series. Reverend Sears has provided resources and we are going to be working with her and her team at Greater St. Luke to broadcast our virtual worship service on February 21st. The third item is the technology seminars and that's where you may come in. We'll be conducting a series of seminars to support leaders within our community and organizations on how to use the MEDI platform. The platform, as I said before, if you logged into our website by typing in your zip code, what we're trying to do is to enable churches and houses of worship to use that as, a, as an extension of their outreach ministries or their outreach services. We will bring in leaders to acquaint them on how this can be used. And this is extremely important, and, and I'll just pause for one second. I participated in a users group in the Delaware, uh, Washington and Maryland area. And the city of Richmond has taken a very aggressive stance on using this technology to be able to support that. So during this seminar, we'll be sharing examples of how it has been implemented in other cities similar to Charleston, where we may be as effective, and I dare say more effective and how we share, serve the citizens of our area. And then finally, we will be using a social media uh, thrust to have worship houses of worship share their success stories. Who among your uh, members has had a success in terms of how they overcame heart disease or who put in a very aggressive uh, plan to ward off the effects of the um, heart disease? So our focus for Red Dress Sunday is going to be a little different than it has been in previous years, but we intend to be as effective in sharing information with our users. So I wanna thank you for allowing me this opportunity. An invitation will be forthcoming on two days, February 16th at 10 a.m. or February 24th at 4.30 p.m. wherein we're inviting community leaders to understand more about the METI, our technology resources, and how we intend to change the lives of the citizens of the city of Charleston. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, great work. And, uh, and I know it's appreciated by a lot of people around our community. Uh, any, any questions for Ms. Williams? Uh, Kevin, um, Garcia, how do you spell Medi in that? How, how is that? What's the website? It's M-E-D-I, the Medi. And it's not an acronym. It's just a reference to the medical neighborhood. And uh, there's a visual or graphic on our website where it shows through uh, the resources of Johnson & Johnson, the pharmaceutical company. Uh, during one of our conferences, their artists captured resources that were conducted. So you'll see the medical, medical neighborhood example, but the Medi is just a derivative of the medical neighborhood. And that's .org? Yes, www.themedi.org. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I'm available. Reverend Sears has my information. I will share that, but I would like to extend an invitation for the two seminars. One is in the morning and one is in the evening. We try to make it convenient for all of our schedules because we're probably technology or Zoomed out, but we do the best we can to hang on. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Hey, Mayor. Hey Thank there. <laughs> um, so, um, Mr. Chairman, if I may um, yes. just thank Garcia and Reverend Sears. And I got to tell you, the Red Dress Sunday event at Greater St. Luke um, was, was really remarkable. If you look down the aisle from from the pulpit, it's almost like that aisle is the, the opening of the Red Sea. With, uh, <laughs> there was so much red on both sides of the aisle and um, uh, a remarkable sermon also by Reverend Sears. But um, I, I'll, I just sent an email to Wack, Mike Wack and, and um, let him connect whatever links you got for the virtual messaging this year we'll send it out to our clergy council and uh, try to help promote that but thank you for your efforts it's really um terrific and we did a proclamation as well thanks we appreciate your support thank you so much you guys have a wonderful day great yeah, yeah appreciate it all right and um it's no it's no secret that uh everything's been a challenge obviously for the recreation department for for Charleston and uh, Laurie Yarborough has done an incredible job of being able to continue to provide recreation in a safe manner. She's been a great leader. And uh, so I'm gonna call on Laurie to uh, give us a report on the recreation. Thank you, Council Member Sheely. Um, let me start by saying that the, any of the efforts that the recreation department were able to pull off to get our kids and our, our families back active were because of the work of folks on this, this phone call. Um, Dr. Richardson has been huge, Jan Park's been huge, Paul's been huge, uh, the connections, just understanding the, um, the guidelines and protocols that we needed to be looking at. It's the only way we've been able to do this. So I'm very appreciative of all those efforts. Um, I'm proud of what we're doing. Uh, I believe that our recreation department here at the city of Charleston has taken the mayor's leadership and leading this community um, in terms of the COVID movement. Uh, I'm proud to be in a city where we're wearing masks and our numbers are, are lower than other places and that we're all trying to take care of one another. So that's kind of bled over into, into recreation. Um, our efforts have centered around those best practices, making sure that we had social distancing, making sure that we created small pods with our children, um, making sure that we limited any kind of transportation. So if you live West Ashley and your child's between five and eight, we're gonna put you in a group of like four other five to eight year old groups. We're not gonna have you going to Daniel Island and, and downtown and all the other areas. So um, we've really tried to do those things. Our coaches have been great. Our staff's been good. We've limited the number of uh, spectators in and around our facilities, trying to keep uh, social distancing down. We've continued to use temperature checks, but probably the best tool we've had and we've gotten the most cooperation from is our families have agreed to let us know if there is an illness in their family. In other words, if there is a teenager that is exposed and gets sick, they're letting us know so that we can allow the other families on those teens to know, hey, two weeks ago, we had, you had a game, you had a child on your team, they had a family exposure. So it's allowed those families to kind of make decisions. Do I want to put my child out there? Do I want not to? Do I want to wait? Um, but we have had very few I'm very proud to say cases where we've had to put entire teams on freeze. Um, we're running indoor basketball right now and outdoor flag football to the tune of 3,200 kids across the city of Charleston. And the only team I have right now that's frozen and they'll become unfrozen tomorrow because their time limit will be up is actually on Daniel Island, which is Berkeley County and not Charleston County School District. So we've been, we've been really careful um, in doing those things. I, I have had some folks say, well, North Charleston's not doing it that way, or so-and-so is not doing it that way. Well, that's okay. We're going to do it the way it works for our kids and our staff and our families to continue this. So we've not had to stop an activity. Um, it's gone really well. We have a meeting next week with the school district. I think uh, the district wants to make sure that any uptick they're seeing in their schools um, is, is, you know, is not anything related to what we're doing. There are a lot of travel leagues. Paul and I talked about this. There's a lot of travel soccer right now. There's a lot of travel volleyball right now. Um, the Trident Basketball League, which is not run by the rec departments, all of that's ongoing. 
obviously there's school teams. So there's a lot of activities going on right now with school age children that a lot of people say, oh, that's rec sports. Well, it might be a rec sport, but it's not being run by especially our city. So um, we'll continue to explore all of the things that are working in other communities. But again, I think the mayor's leadership in saying, this is what we have to do. We have to listen to our healthcare professionals. We have to follow these practices. And if you do them, you can be safe. Um, so anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Channel 5 did a nice little piece this morning on what the city's doing. Um, so that was good. It's just kind of nice to get out there in a positive way. But the main thing is we need to keep these kids active and, and doing things. They're not getting a lot of physical activity. Um, and obviously social, social is uh, being social with their peers and being able to just blow off some steam. All those things that we as grownups need to do um, kids need to do them too. So we just want to continue to be successful in that. And I'm appreciative of what uh, the city's allowed us to do even under phase two. Um, and again, Mayor, thank you for your leadership every day on this, on this adventure. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I, I know it's been a challenge. I know you've had a tough, tough job and you've done a great job. So we appreciate it. Thank you very much for what you, for what you've done. Any questions for Laurie and what the city recreation program? Paul, do you have something? Well, I was just on Laurie. Is there any uh, anything you want to update on the, the city plan at all? In, in, in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan? Thanks, Paul. So we had a great meeting with our consultant last week. Um, we brought in a number of staff members in planning, in parks, and in recreation. Um, to have some, some further discussions about some of the results that are already coming in initially. So the consultant's going to be going back to the steering committee. I know Council Member Sheely, you're on that, that committee. Expect something from them. Um, but we definitely think we'll have a, a, something ready to go forward after that meeting um, as early as April, the beginning of April. I know the mayor's anxious to see it, uh, but it's going to be a really good tool to show us what areas need more land, need more parks, where we need more programs. Um, so Paul, I look for that to be out in the next two months. And they've done a great job considering we've had no face-to-face -face meetings. Everything's had to be technology and virtual, but, uh, but they've also gotten a lot of input. So we're pretty excited about that. Great, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to comment on um, you. Laurie, you're so kind. Uh, um, shout out to me, but it's really been such a team effort. Um, it's been remarkable over the last year with, with all of our city staff and all of you and other community members. But I, I just remember uh, one instance last um, May, I think it was, and, and we were all just trying to figure this thing out, right? We were listening to Katie and, and MUSC and, and others, but um um, uh, we were all trying to figure this thing out and, and Laurie wanted, uh, felt so strongly. We needed to continue to engage our kids. They were, um, virtual learning. They weren't, you know, connecting and, um, that can lead to all other kind of issues. And so she, she asked me, well, mayor, can, can we keep our summer camp program going? And, and, you know, there wasn't a guidebook out there as to how to conduct a summer camp safely with the advent of COVID-19. And, you know, they just figured it out. They figured it out. They were resolved to try to do the right thing and do it safely, but also give our kids that opportunity last summer to, uh, to uh, have, ha have the engagement and activity. So um, my hat's off to you, but um, uh, once again, this was an incredible team effort. Thank you, Mayor. I, I agree. If Dr. Richardson's told me one thing, she's told me a hundred things. So that's been my help and my go-to. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Laurie. Appreciate all that you do. Thank you very much. And uh, so we'll um, move on to our city updates. I know that um, that Paul wants to talk a little bit about Ron Brinson um, and his little article that he put out and the discrepancy of um, health by zip codes and areas and, and, and all of that. So I'm going to call on Paul for that now. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I, I, the mayor shared an article with me that I, I sent to you in an email um, on Monday that said commentary, Charleston Neck is livable thanks to one man's anti-pollution fight. And, and I hope you had a chance to read it. And, and my only takeaway from that, that note was, was the fact that doing something 
does make a difference. And, and just a little bit of something he did with looking at pollution knocked added 3.6 years of life to um, that was gained in just two years in that community. So as we're talking about and next month, um, Susan um, and her, the group that was going to help work on that um, health and all policies um, to, to what we can do in the city. I just think we need to be thinking about that, about what one, one little, um, one little being bold enough and doing one little thing can really make that difference. And I wanted to, um, I was looking to see if I had my screen that I could share, but I don't see that right now. But, but we looked at, I had my intern pull up some data from the, uh, from the, the, the city dashboard. You, you know what that one looks like that had, um, that, New York City uh, or New York University pulled together the medical side and we were just looking in those zip codes and, and, it, and if you look at everything that's going on, high blood pressure is, is very prevalent. The life expectancy is around that 79 to, or 70 to, to 80 age um, group. Obesity, the 25 to 30 percent in all our areas, the cardiovascular disease, in the 2941 area, it was like 179 to every 211 out of um, 100,000 of habit. And by diabetes is ranging from the low low percentages up to 25% in some of our neighborhoods. So I, it's, it's just one of those items that we, once we start health and policies, we, we really have to look, how do we change what we're doing in our city to start moving that needle again as was moved in, in the late 60s. And Mayor, thank you for sharing that. That was a, a great, great reminder that just doing something does can make a difference with it all. So well, that's sure. what I mainly wanted to share. Well, well, it was Ron Brinson, who's on North Charleston uh, City Council, who shared that with me. He also writes for the Post and Courier, and apparently he had written the article a few years ago about Dr. Jacobs, who apparently was a remarkable man. I did not know him, but um, when when I read the article, it, it it reminded me once again. I know we've talked about it numerous times about this this zip code map and the life expectancies. Thank you, Katie, for for um, I think we've improved this, but but it's iron it's more than ironic. Um, the areas on this map that have the lowest life expectancy are still that same area that Dr. Jacobs worked on that had the environmental issues. Um, and, and those plants are no longer there. So uh, there are other underlying um, um, disparities that exist among these communities. Um, and, and once again, and it really probably most of the population is on the Southern part of North Charleston rather than but, but some of it's in the northern part of, of, of our city as well. So um, it, it was a great opportunity. I sent the map to Ron Brinson after we communicated in the last week. And, and I think um, we need to partner with the city of North Charleston and really focus on these couple of areas, particularly where the, the life expectancy is still in the 60s. They might've moved it three years, you know, 20 years ago, but we, we can, we need to move it a, at least another three years and get them all up in the seventies. Can we agree on that? Sir. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any other questions on that from, for Paul or for the mayor? Or any ideas or, or comments on, on <clears throat> trying to get there? Dan, you have something? Yeah. Just a, just a quick comment that uh, absolutely right. Just doing a little bit can, can make a big difference. And that as we as we think about the health and all policies effort, you know, there, there are some really nice tools out there to also measure, not that I'm not interested in improving uh, uh, life, you know, life quality and quantity. Obviously, that that's of greatest interest to me, but it's not necessarily to everybody. And, and economics sometimes uh, rules the day. And I would just say that there are some very good tools out there that we can use 
to measure the economic impact of some of these policies that we may put in place or practices that we may put in place. Um, and I'd be happy to, to share those with, with, with different folks, but, uh, but there are ways for us to measure that. And I just wanted to put that out there as uh, maybe a, a proximal thing that we can measure that may be meaningful uh, to, to individuals who frankly, and, or sadly, may not care that much about health disparities, but may care about economic impact. That's it. Thank you. Paul, it looks like you do have your screen shared now. Yeah, I was having a, um, I, I figured it out. Okay. okay. But that's a, just a, um, a, a little, this, the, what we were talking about, those age groups, and you see the red area is mostly in the 29403 and the 29405 areas of, is where we're really showing the areas that we, I mean, just, it's up to us to help make that difference. And so I, um, I just like to keep it in front of us that we, we, there's, there, we, we just got to keep talking with each other and figuring out what that something is that we can do short term and long term to, to really make a difference with it. So, so um, Paul, that, that next map though, drills on down a little more. And um, I don't know if you can. The North Charleston you, one. Well, it, it was still, um, the overall region, but it just did a, um, it focused in a little closer on the peninsula and North Charleston areas and showed yeah. you how it broke down into even the sixties um, uh, amongst those um, areas where you're showing 72 and 74, actually the averages go down to 66.6, um, the lowest I see in, and that's um, like Rosemount and there you go. Yeah, do y'all see all that one? Yeah, yeah, that's the most telling one. And I mean, a lot of those uh, disparities that you mentioned are all the things that, that uh, Garcia was just talking about and Reverend Sears. So um, Reverend Sears, I saw you, you on, the, on the line. Uh, can we challenge ourselves to reach out to all the churches that are in those areas and, and, and even make that effort here in February to, to, to spread the message in all those 69, 60 and low 70 areas and, and, and um, get more communication going about those, those specific issues of heart disease, diabetes, um, 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 obesity, those, those are the key disparities, aren't they, that are leading to these lower numbers? Dr. Richardson? Um, yes, and I would add COVID to that as well. <laughs> and add uh, COVID to that as well, okay. So, um, yes, <sighs> cancer, I mean, all of the chronic diseases certainly lead to the disparities, as do many of our social determinants of health. Um, around housing and food insecurity, transportation. Um, this is something that I think Healthy Tri-County can also definitely play um, a large role um, in assisting. And, you know, and I think COVID really maybe a silver lining will be that, that these disparities, as Dan was saying, you know, if you need something proximal to get you sort of more um, engaged, um, you know, the disparity in hospitalizations and death rates, and now the disparity in vaccination rates um, in our communities of color uh, compared to our white communities are very stark and something that we can begin um, along with um, heart disease and everything else that we need to be working on, but we're really... Um, begin to develop tools that allow us to, um, to better um, address health equity sort of head on and then use those tools that are developed around COVID um, in other um, areas of disparity. Um, Great. I hope that will be the case. Understood. And yeah, can I just... I I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Get, get, go ahead, Annie, thank you. I was just gonna add one additional driver of these disparities that we haven't mentioned yet, which is gun violence, you know, which disproportionately affects our black and brown communities. 
And we have been working, you know, you all heard from Dr. Hink, the trauma surgeon here at MUSC about her plan for a hospital-based violence intervention program that will serve all of these communities. And uh, I meant to email Paul before this meeting, but we did find out that we will be funded and that program is gonna start to offer services Great. to our community um, this spring, hopefully. We're still waiting to hear on the Duke Endowment Grant, but we have commitment from MUSC to start that program. So that will help some of this issue. Dr. Andrews, I would guess that would play in with drug use, drug abuse, overdose, that type of thing as well. Is that, is that sure? Correct? Yeah, there's intersectionality there for sure. But that's another opportunity, um, as the mayor was mentioning, partnering with North Charleston. You know, the program will be housed at MUSC, but it will serve um, the North Charleston community as well. So we're continuing to work on ways to bring them into the fold. Thank you for that. Dan, did you have something further? Yeah, I, I was just going to, uh, yeah, I shared with uh, with the group that uh, to, to the mayor's point about engaging, you know, the faith-based community. Um, yes, there, there are a myriad of factors that contribute to these uh, differential rates of, of premature death. Uh, among them, uh, gun violence, uh, you know, there are many different factors. Um, physical activity is another one, and the, the U.S. National Physical Activity Plan does have an entire section or sector that's devoted to the faith-based community. And it, it is quite rich with, uh, with a roadmap, essentially, for engaging the faith-based community in encouraging physical activity um, within their communities uh, in order to prevent many of these uh, uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. So I just wanted to say that I, I had put that in the chat box as a, as a resource um, and happy to, uh, to, to lend a hand if and when necessary there. All right. Well, thank you very much. If, if I may interject here, yeah, um, and ahead, for, forgive me, I'm, I'm driving to a funeral. <laughs> okay. um, so in our communities, if you find the pillar, the influencer in our communities, you can make a great impact. And usually they're involved in houses of worship. Um, it's a matter of identifying these people and then um, training them and exposing them to this knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in um, working with all of you to try to make that happen. Um, I'm, I'll put something together and then introduce it um, at another time. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Joey. Yeah, Healthy Tri-County was mentioned earlier, and I think it, it's clear that this is a topic that each of us uh, are passionate about, and each of us in our own respective kind of organizations and places of influence are, are trying our best to, to tackle, right, and solve. And there's so many facets to this, and even just looking at life expectancy, you can you can imagine that there are a range of factors that affect that from your behavioral, uh, you know, um, activities uh, of an individual to their clinical um, setting to their environment, right? And so uh, it can sometimes feel a little overwhelming to try to tackle this uh, because there are so many things that we can do. And programmatically, I think that there are, are groups out there like Healthy Track County um, and uh, our members and other, other folks who are, who are hoping to try to implement programming uh, within these zip codes to help folks um, with, these, uh, with these health disparities. I think what this group is uniquely situated to do is to take a look from a policy level uh, at some things that we could recommend uh, or that we could just, just take a look at and map um, and see if there are things related to transportation, if there are things related to zoning, if there are um, certain, certain things that the city has control over that we can hopefully, we know, will move the needle on these things, maybe not immediately, but down the road. Um, and so that is what the Health and All Policies kind of subcommittee is hoping to, to do. Um, but if folks have, ha are interested in looking at programming, specifically working in our, in our communities of faith and in these zip codes at 29405, uh, and others, uh, please let me know. We are happy to partner with you. We already have some great programs in the works, uh, partnering with folks like the American Heart Association um, and even some homegrown programming uh, within our church communities like at Mount Moriah, um, Missionary Baptist and others. So just let me know if you guys uh, have any specific ideas and I'm happy to share out with the group uh, what we're working on. 
Thank you, Joey. Appreciate that. Anybody else before we move on? Well, thank you for all the work on that. We appreciate it. And um, I guess now I'll uh, I'll call on Tracy McKee, um, and uh, so she can give us some COVID updates and what's going on there. So thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be brief and um, hopefully just uh, set the table maybe for Dr. Richardson to, to give us some more in-depth updates. Um, at the Charleston um, kind of zip code level, Charleston City zip code level anyway, um, you know, we've seen a decrease in the number of cases. So our seven day average has gone down about um, roughly 13% over the past couple of weeks. So so that's good and, and roughly the same um, decrease in the tri-county area. Um, so um, uh, hopefully we keep continue, continuing on that same trajectory. Um, and hospitalizations, um, you know, based on, you know, what I'm seeing from DHEC reporting, those seem to have stabilized. They're still probably a little on the high side for what we would like to see, um, but, um, but they do seem to be fairly stable. Um, and just kind of one, um, points it, within the city itself with the new variants that are here that um, that seem to transmit more easily. We're actually encouraging city staff to double mask when they are unable to social distance at work. So if they're moving about offices, times that they would normally wear a mask, we're actually encouraging them to, to double mask at this point. Um, just a little kind of doubling down and, and trying to make sure that we have um, less hosts for this thing to keep mutating on us. Um, and so really quickly, just about vaccinations, just some observations. Um, you know, we're kind of, I think next week is nine weeks into um, getting, um, having vaccinations out on the streets, if you will. And as of next week, we'll have enough first doses to cover about 12% of the population in South Carolina. And that's pretty much that same percentage is really the same across the US. Um, looking at um, DHEX reporting, 95% of the, the of the Pfizer that's been distributed to South Carolina has actually been administered. Um, and I'm not sure if this is just we're not seeing maybe the Moderna utilization isn't coming back as quickly to DHEC, um, but we're kind of only showing like 17% of those first doses of Moderna have actually been administered. And just kind of FYI, hopefully next, next time you all meet, we'll have some more details, but our emergency management team um, is working closely with um, MUSC and some other um, kind of local pharmacies to identify vaccination sta stations. So that when we do, when something breaks loose and we start to get um, more doses, um, especially when it exceeds um, MUSC's capacity and those pharmacies to actually administer. Um, so we'll have those stations um, set up and ready to go to, to, to accommodate that need. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you, Tracy. Um, can you give us an update on how we're doing with our vaccinations for police officers and firefighters right now? Yeah, so um, any police officer or firefighter who has who wants to be vaccinated has had the opportunity to get vaccinated. Thank you. Sure. Any, any other questions for Tracy? All right, I'll uh, call on Dr. Richardson then, if she will. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so I always have more information than I sort of, um, I don't know, I, want, I don't want to get too much in the weeds and any one thing would rather just sort of take questions. But um, I did want to say, while well, Tracy um, did start an optimistic note, and I don't want to rain on that parade, um, South Carolina is still second in the nation for number of new cases per population. And South Carolina is, Charleston is doing better than much of the rest of the state, but we still have a long way to go. And we look at our, um, we sort of look at recent disease activity by county um, that's done sort of averaging the last two weeks and Charleston along with every other county in our state is still in that high category for percent positivity as well as for incidence rate over the two weeks. So we are moving in the right direction, but we um, still have a long way to go. And I just wanna emphasize Tracy's point that 
the less transmission we have in the community, the less chance we have for these variants um, to become the dominant strains, you know, in a short amount of time. Uh, DHEC and CDC are not yet specifically recommending double masking, but I do think it is a good idea um, when around, uh, when in crowds or uh, when you're unable to physically distance or social um, distance. So that's not an official recommendation yet, but um, it certainly doesn't hurt. And, um, and just that attention to everyone masking, at least with one mask, um, and the city's doing a great job, I think, um, you know, helping to make that happen um, in our cities. And then lastly, before I sort of move forward, I really do want to give a shout out to Lori and the rec department. And even in comparison to other rec departments um, in our area, uh, my own kids have played tennis and soccer and flag football this year with the rec department in the city. Um, and I've been really impressed when on the field and um, observing practices and, um, and games. And so uh, kudos to them. And Laurie, I look forward to joining you next week on the call with, um, with CCSD. Um, and others. So just a few, um, I wanted to touch on a few things and then just really want to um, open it up. So yesterday, Charleston did have the, the third most cases of any county in South Carolina. Um, we are one of the largest counties, but we have not really usually been cracking that with um, Greenville and Spartanburg and Myrtle Beach um, and Columbia in there, but we are now um, at least for yesterday, um, we are in that um, um, sort of top three. Uh, I did want to talk briefly that we've changed the way we calculate percent positivity. So you will see a drop. I think two days ago it was 20%. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's somewhere around there. Yesterday it was 8.8%. That's just because we are changing the way we calculate that to be more in line with other states. So the CDC is able to compare apples to apples um, instead of apples to oranges. Um, so basically we're looking at test over tests now as opposed to um, individuals over individuals. Uh, and um, the federal government has just been moving in the direction of using um, test over test. And so South Carolina has been working on that and we've now implemented that as of um, yesterday. Uh, I did mention um, the, um, the disparities and just want to highlight that again, that we're seeing uh, Black people in the U.S. having died of COVID-19 at a rate of 1.5 times more um, than white people and Latinos having died at a rate of 1.2 times uh, higher. And I will um, briefly touch on some of the disparity that we've seen so far in um, vaccination rates, not in South Carolina. We haven't um, put this data together yet for South Carolina, but, um, but as a nation. Um, we've also seen a, a recent um, article come out about that it's really the individuals ages 20 to 49 that seem to be driving transmission. And this is really nationwide. Um, but there is then this sort of um, push pull about, you know, who to vaccinate and where, where to go, given we still have more demand um, than supply. But at the time of sort of high transmission rates, DHEC um, is still siding with the sort of um, priority of decreasing deaths. And so that still means that we are prioritizing um, those that are older in our communities um, rather than those who are younger and potentially um, increasing the transmission in our community, which is why those mitigation efforts with masking and physical distancing, um, hand hygiene, avoiding crowds is so, um, so important. Um, I thought I would just touch a little bit on the variants. So late last week, South Carolina um, did diagnose the first two um, cases of the South African variant. We now have a third case of that variant. And Low Country also diagnosed the first case of the UK variant um, late last week. Um, and while we're still learning um, about these variants, um, what we do believe is that the vaccine um, will remain effective, but not 
quite as effective against at least some of these um, variants. Um, we do believe the diagnostic test um, will pick up uh, these variants. Uh, the variants seem to be more contagious. And I think that the evidence is still out whether they may be may cause somewhat more severe disease. Um, we're not sure about that yet, but we know that they're probably 50 to 70 percent more contagious. Uh, and um, and so we we're they are used for diagnostic purposes. They do take a while to return. Um, and so we're not changing sort of our case investigation or contact tracing or mitigation efforts around that particular positive case, um, but are beginning to rethink. And I'm not sure who on this call I have talked about this, but there was some movement towards saying that those who were vaccinated fully would not need to quarantine. CDC and DHEC now have backed away from that guidance, which was never actually put out officially to say we, we are still recommending quarantine for those who are deemed close contacts of a positive case, even when fully vaccinated and after that one to two week period. So I don't think Jan's on the call, Paul, but I think that I did relay that guidance previously to her around city employees. So um, just have her reach out to me if she wants to um, discuss that um, further. Um, what else do I wanna um, cover briefly? As Tracy said, we, we are trying to get the vaccine out as quickly as we can. Just a, a bit about the Moderna vaccine. Um, as you may be seen in the news, uh, South Carolina decided to give sort of all doses of our initial Moderna vaccine allocations to the federal uh, long-term care facility program. So we went to CVS and Walgreens to vaccinate those in nursing homes and assisted living facilities as well as um, staff. Um, they have finished um, first rounds of all nursing homes and um, should sometime this month um, finish first round or first doses for assisted living. Um, the, the last, um, the last information I heard is that somewhere between 60 and 75% of residents to date have um, chosen to receive the first dose, but only about 40% of um, staff. So, um, so that's certainly something that all who um, interact with long-term care facilities, um, we are working to, to address vaccine hesitancy. Um, in those communities as well as, as generally, but that does mean that there are many more doses um, sitting in that program. And there is talk now about whether we should sort of reallocate them back to the sort of general um, statewide supply and then give them to others who can, can use them more quickly um, with the caveat that of course we want staff and residents in long-term care facilities to be covered. Um, if and when they, they choose to, um, for that to happen. Um, we have rolled out a new phone number for, for vaccine questions. Um, there was certainly a lot of difficulty in the beginning weeks of getting through to our care line. Um, in the next few days, we, if not, already, it may be official. Um, we are also rolling out a new online appointing system um, for um, vaccinations to assist, especially with our elderly and being able to find a loc location um, close to them. As far as moving on to additional populations, uh, the governor uh, would like us to move to those uh, 65 and over, down from 70 and over, and we are working to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, also, phase, there's many questions from phase 1B, and Paula, I am looking into the question that you sent me yesterday about um, taxi drivers. Uh, we'll get back to you about that. But there's a lot of questions about who qualifies in 1B. What does it mean to be an essential business? What does it mean to be a frontline essential worker within those businesses? Um, and so the Vaccine Advisory Committee um, and DHEC are, are working to try to make those decisions and then word it as clearly as possible um, so that there um, is um, 
distribution to those um, who qualify with, without having um, those who um, don't, you know, be sort of unnecessarily led on and then, and then told no, that, that it's not going to work for them. Um, and then, um, I don't know, I could go on, but I think the last thing is that there will be some direct shipments to pharmacies from the federal government um, beginning uh, next week. That's already sort of happened like to Walmart's um, to date, but there'll be more. And South Carolina is also getting some more Moderna vaccine beginning this week than we had before, about 16,000 extra doses. So we hope to continue to see our allotment um, increase. Um, there's certainly good news on the horizon, potential good news about Johnson & Johnson um, applying for emergency authorization, such that we have a third option uh, for the vaccine. Um, I think I'll stop there and just see if there are any um, questions that I can address. I have a question, Dr. Richardson, it's Lori. Um, so I noticed yesterday that we had gone from a 30, almost a 30% positivity rate to 8.8. .8, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. We made great inroads. <laughs> so tell me what this new scale is and what I should be looking for. So is it still anything under five is good? Uh, yeah, so what the, the sort of messaging around this is that there's really no change, as you can imagine, from, you know, from two days ago to yesterday. Um, it's just a change in how we calculate it. But our website has gone back and retroactively calculated the percent positivity using the, the new um, formula. So you can still see trends and the trends are, are should be the same. Um, but yes, um, as far as I know, the goal of the less than 5%, although some states, you know, once they get to 5% say, well, now we want 3% or 1%, certainly lower is better. Um, but that, uh, that is still the goal um, is the 5%. And that's one of the reasons for changing the formula is we felt like I think South Carolina is now ranked third in the nation for percent positivity. Well, we, you know, we want it to, to accurately reflect how is our percent positivity compared to other states um, in the US, not compared to what we were presenting um, previously. So that's why all those calculations have been redone. We do feel like there's been some decrease um, since uh, the peaks, you know, right after the holiday um, season in percent positivity, but certainly that large drop is just a difference in calculation. Mr. Mayor. So um, Katie, if you will, I know that sometimes data coagulates or or delays and then you reported at one time. And so a week or so ago, when I saw the first uh, death reports over 200, I, I, I believed that it was just that kind of thing. But then I saw three or four days later, another day you reported over 200. Is this, is it more deadly? I mean, it seems like the death rate has, has increased significantly lately. Um. So I also think that that uh, is a result of a data dump and not necessarily, I mean, we have seen, we know the deaths lag hospitalizations, which lag, um, you know, right. positive tests. Right. Um, and so there certainly have been increase in deaths um, to our highest levels in South Carolina and, um, and in the low country. Um, in recent weeks, but those large dumps of two times of over 200 really were related to a change in our vital records system. Uh, and that caused a delay in reporting deaths. So our website does sort of take that number of deaths and then apply it to how many how many deaths occurred per day. And you'll see that, that when it's 200, those deaths are really spread out over a several week, um, week time period. Um, mm -hmm. So while it's, it's not good news, it's not as bad a, as those sort of very large numbers um, would initially indicate. This is kind of in the weeds, but do y'all go back and, and reclassify the probable deaths to deaths once you know more or that just, kind of stays out there? Um, sometimes the probable uh, deaths are 
Often when a provider will say on a death certificate that, that it was due to COVID-19, but there's actually no lab test um, to confirm that. So I see. If, if a lab test isn't done and it can even be done as part of an autopsy or post-mortem, um, then we will reclassify based on that lab result. But, but if no lab result um, comes, then, th then they stay probable. Gotcha. Thank you. I think Jennifer Roberts says. Um, yeah, hi. I'm, I'm going to show my ignorance here, but I'm trying to understand in my head what test to test versus in person to person means <laughs> because they all get a, one test. So can you, can you explain that for me? Uh, well, I think that is part of it is that often people don't just get one test. Um, so test to test means a positive test over all tests that were done, positive and negative. But Versus, they're getting two tests in a day? Um, well, some people have sort of a PCR and a rapid done on the same day. And if that rapid is positive, then they'll sit or either way, whether it's positive or negative, then they will send um, the PCR off sort of for as a more um, accurate test. Um, it is, I'm not sure I can explain it at the moment any, any better than that. Uh, I Thank can you. certainly go back and, and sort of, um, discuss it with our, with our surveillance, um, group, but, but it is that it, it's looking at individuals, unique individuals versus, um, versus test. And because of that, it does. I agree that it doesn't sound like it should drop it that much from 20 to eight, um, because not everyone obviously is getting uh, multiple um, tests, but, um, but that is the reason that's given for the, for the drop, so. Well, thank you, Dr. Richardson. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Dr. Richardson. Current has a, has a question, I believe. So. Oh, Dr. Richardson, yeah, just real quick, if you could help clarify the messaging again for folks who are fully vaccinated, uh, I think there is still, I think, a lot of confusion out there as we, we message, we, we share this message out to our constituents about, um, so we're hearing today that even if you are fully vaccinated, if you're in contact with someone who tests positive, you still need to quarantine. Is it still important for people who are fully vaccinated to social distance and wear masks? Um. So yes, the, the general answer is yes to all of those. And that's because there, there are not very many other people that are fully vaccinated in our communities um, right now. Um, I think that, so I think that's the, the general messaging that we do want to get out there. Um, number one, as you said, that, that while there was some some thought or some movement towards no more need to, to quarantine um, because of these variants primarily and just trying to understand better what is the trajectory that we're going to see as you know, the, the variants in South Africa in, um, in the UK have become the dominant variant um, over um, a period of um, two to three months. And so we are um, concerned that that may occur here as well. And so we want to understand better um, whether those who've previously been diagnosed with a COVID infection may be more susceptible to one of these um, variants um, if they are exposed, as well as um, how will the vaccine perform against um, these variants prior to sort of relaxing that messaging. So so it, it is, um, we are trying to find a balance. We definitely believe that the vaccine is our way out of this pandemic. Um, and so we very much believe even now that the vaccine is sort of the, the best way forward um, for our population to develop herd immunity. Um, that being said, we don't want those most of the people who've gotten the vaccine are higher risk and we don't want um, those individuals to let their guard down too much because they may be able to transmit to others, even though they're asymptomatic 
or they may be more at risk if the vaccine is found to be less effective against um, some of the variants. So, um, so I think that is the, um, the, the general messaging to the public. That being said, I think, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, two people who are fully vaccinated and have waited their, you know, two weeks after that second dose, um, you know, I do think that they're able then to gather together in smaller groups um, and feel more comfortable um, that each is um, much better protected than they would have been um, otherwise. Thank you. I believe Carolyn Murray may have been trying to ask a question. And Dr. Richardson is not at all surprised by that. <laughs> Good morning, I always Dr. appreciate Richardson. your questions, Karen. <laughs> I appreciate your answers and I appreciate your passion. Um, DHEC made a recommendation about in-hospital patients 65 and older getting the vaccine. It appears that MUSC is the only local provider actually doing that. I'm curious about your reaction to that. And is there a way to make a stronger recommendation to these providers so that this very vulnerable population of people are getting the vaccine? Uh, well, we're always working on better communication. So that would certainly be the, the first thing is, uh, have we communicated that sufficiently to all of our hospital providers? And, uh, and we can always do more of that. And then the second part is we know our health systems are working very hard to, to help get the public um, vaccinated. And so this is yet one more process that they will need to put in place. Um, and so I, I, I do believe that they should be doing it. Um, I don't know which ones are doing it and, and, and which aren't, but, but certainly we'd like to get the message out that this is a group 65 and over who are hospitalized for something other than COVID that we do recommend um, getting vaccinated um, in uh, phase 1A. So thank you for helping us get that message out. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Any other questions? Um, Dr. Andrews, yes. do you have anything to add? Oh, I'm sorry. Crystal Sears has a question. I apologize. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, as a clergy person, and, and I hear this in, in my circles, we, um, you know, serve people who are sick, you know, funerals. I'm on, on my way to a situation right now where a family has experienced COVID. Can clergy persons, um, especially pastors, get in the line for getting vaccinated. I, I know, I don't know if we're classified as frontline workers or essential workers. How do we make that happen? Um, so I can elevate that request, which I think is reasonable to our vaccine advisory committee who right now is working on finalizing the phase 1B um, criteria. Um, it, you, I've actually gotten this request from several other um, members of the clergy in the Lowcountry region and, and have elevated those requests. There's also an email address, acc-vac, the AC, at dhac.sc.gov, where you yourself and um, your colleagues can send an email directly um, making this, uh, this request. Phase 1B has not been finalized, so I don't know whether clergy um, are included or um, are not, but um, certainly I would say that, that you are um, a frontline essential worker. It's just a matter of, you know, how, how we know we've got, um, you know, limited vaccine right now. And we just, we're trying to make the best decisions possible for, for how to distribute that in an equitable way. So I will certainly elevate it. Feel free to send um, an email to that, um, that email group. Those decisions are not being made on the regional level. Those are, will be statewide decisions and low country region will follow um, that guidance when, um, when phase B does get um, enacted. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I'll um, ask Dr. Andrews again if she has anything from her side that she'd like to add. I was just gonna add that um, Live 5 News covered the story just to 
a raise awareness about MISC, which is the COVID complication that children can experience and that our state had its first child death from MISC. So I just encourage folks to look up that story and be aware and spread that knowledge. Although it's still exceedingly rare, it's something we all need to be vigilant about. Thank you. All right, and then um, I know, um, let's see Maggie Dangerfield on here. I know that um, Charleston County is halfway through the uh, school year. I think this week, I think exams are taking place. So the first, what well, the second quarter, first semester is uh, coming to an end and uh, the second half will start on Monday, I guess. So I, I saw where, um, where it was decided that Charleston County will stay open now through the way that it was regularly planned and not stop early. But uh, Maggie, do you have any updates for us for the Charleston County? Sure. Thank you so much, Councilman. Um, just a, a few things. We've had, you know, a really exciting week. If y'all have seen the news about Principal Darby and um, some of the things that he is doing um, in his spare time to support his students. Um, so that, you know, that's been um, a nice, you know, kind of heartwarming piece of, of um, news that has been shared across national platforms and, and locally here as well um, for those students in North Charleston High School. Um, as you mentioned, uh, there was a discussion held last week. There were some parents that had um, brought to the district's attention their desire to end the uh, school year earlier than June 18. And so we wanted to um, engage parents, teachers, uh, and principals about the feasibility in which that could potentially happen given the limited number of days we have left in the calendar. Um, because while the state has waived seat time um, for some secondary courses, they have not waived the required 180 days of instruction. So it, it, it makes it rather challenging to still administer those 180 days without cutting into scheduled breaks and, and things of that sort. So we wanted to, have, of course, um, inform our board of that request and then engage our um, stakeholders on their thoughts about the trade-offs that may need to occur to make that happen. Um, and then it was just through those conversations deemed to be too disruptive um, to just continue to make any modifications. So um, we informed our families of that uh, Monday evening. Um, and, and so that will remain the same. And we are currently in development of our um, school year calendar for next year. So that will be coming out here in the next couple of weeks, you know, we, we routinely engage the public with voting on, um, you know, at least two options for that. So that will be coming out soon. Um, our school choice window and our CD, our, our 4K program and Head Start programs applications um, opened last week, um, January 26, and they run for the whole month. They're not first come first serve. Um, those can be uh, digitally submitted on our website there's a link to the school choice. That's for our charter magnet Montessori programs as well as our um, 4K program um, and Head Starts and those run through February 26. Um, additionally, you know, kind of COVID uh, related, we did administer a vaccine interest survey to our staff um, and we have left that open for a little bit, but we've received about, you know, 4,400 responses um, out of our, you know, almost 7,000 employees and about 81% have um, indicated that they would want the vaccine. 11% um, are undecided, 6% uh, have kind of indicated no, and 2% have already been vaccinated, um, you know, because we do have some nurses, speech pathologists, um, some staff over 70, things like that. So um, the State Department uh, asked districts to submit uh, numbers based off of interest surveys. So we did do that last week, um, which will just better inform the state as they look as we shift into 1B on um, you know, vaccine allocations and, and how that's going to go with um, the school district. We do have a plan in place for when we do receive a call. Um, so we will you know, just move and shift and, and get everything ready for kind of mass distribution um, if we have the opportunity for that with our staff in partnership with MUSC. Uh, another thing that we started uh, last week was email notification to elementary families if there is a positive COVID case in a child's class. Um, just a very uh, high level email that would go out to the class saying there, were, there was a positive COVID case in your child's class. Um, and certainly if that child was a close contact, deemed a close contact through our contact tracers, they would be notified ahead of that. And so they would know, um, you know, their personal level of, of exposure or not. Um, but that was, you know, something that parents really 
had desired um, and staff um, for that notification to go into place. And we have plans to start that notification at middle and high schools soon. Um, that was a little bit more complicated than elementaries because they do change classes. So, you know, determining the feasibility of doing that, but um, those plans are almost nearly finalized to enable that notification to let a student know that there was a positive case in a class that they attended. Um, so that, you know, more on that will be coming out in the next couple of days. Uh, and then lastly, our varsity athletics resumed uh, competition on January 25th and our JV started practicing again. Um, going forward, the JV will just play games interdistrictly, but, um, you know, varsity basketball and wrestling can still compete in regional competitions and things of that sort. So, um, those are the big things going on. We also have a, a really great app I just wanted to share. Um, we push out all of our notifications on that app. You can uh, download it out of the Google Play Store or you know, in the App Store on your iPhone. Um, so you'll get all of our district notifications there. You can set your preferences to your child's school if you have a child in our district. And we also have something called a CCSD Minute, which is like a one minute video recap of all the news that week. So um, trying to just expand our, our ways in which we're reaching families and quick snippets of all of these many things going on um, that we can figure out. Thank you, Maggie. Appreciate that. And all the work that uh, Charleston County Schools has done to uh, keep things going and keep it done, having things done safely as well. So excellent job and thank you so much. Uh, any questions for Maggie before we move on? Thank you again. Um, did uh, Paul, who did I leave out? Do, do we need to go anywhere else here on the agenda? Oh, you're still on mute. There yeah, the, is there any other, um, anybody else got any um, community uh, update from your divisions or departments or agencies or anything that we need to be aware of that we can help push out? Well, y'all, thank you so much for your time. Um, I appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, commitment to this committee. It, it helps us a lot. So, uh, to have this committee, um, good things come out of this committee. So and we know your time's valuable and we appreciate it. So uh, with that, if we don't have anything else, I'll uh, call the meeting to adjourn. But thank you again. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>